This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. And it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. Seated right now in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I'm taught the Word of God, my life has changed for the better. And I'll never be the same again. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're in this series on what did Jesus really say. And uh, part of it is because he is so misrepresented. And uh, the world out here, not just politicians, but preachers, the world out here, they just make up stuff and say, Jesus said this and Jesus said that. And uh, so we just felt like it'd be a good thing to go to the Bible and actually work our way through chronologically. You may wonder how we're doing this. We're doing our best to work through chronologically and just look at what did Jesus really say. Let's pick up in Matthew 8. Last week we were in Luke's gospel. We switch over to Matthew's gospel. And uh, in Matthew's version, I'm going to go ahead and read the passage we dealt with last Sunday because it sets the stage for the message this morning. Matthew chapter 8, when he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And that's really the question, isn't it? It's always the question when we need to be set free, when we need to be delivered, when we need to be healed. Is he willing? And unfortunately, my entire life, I've, I've been around and heard and uh, listened to people who would create doubt in this regard. You've heard people say, well, when you pray, sometimes the Lord gives you the green light, that's yes. Sometimes the Lord gives you the red light, that's no. Sometimes the Lord gives you the yellow light, means wait. I mean, you've heard all of this. And uh, I like what Kenneth Hagin used to teach. If we'll just pray according to the word, the answer has always got to be yes, because he cannot disagree with his word. And so, you know, I could ask the Lord to help me be the biggest drug dealer in Tarrant County. Well, of course he might say no. But if I'll pray, if I'll actually take the time and find out what his word says and pray according to his word, then I'm going to get this answer. Yeah, he's willing. Picking up in verse uh, three, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing. He said, be clean. And we pointed out last time that the faith of Jesus was fearless. He touched the man who had leprosy and he was, he wasn't just a leper. We find out in Luke's gospel, he was covered with leprosy. Obviously it was communicable, contagious. And then he speaks to the disease. And our problem is we talk about the disease. We confess the disease. uh, We even claim the disease. Uh, You know, I've heard people talk about my arthritis or talk about my high blood pressure. So we talk about the disease. We actually claim the disease. But Jesus spoke to it. And we see this as a pattern in his life and ministry. and, And he also didn't just speak to diseases, but he spoke to demons. And he spoke with authority. I am willing. He said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And right here we see that uh, Jesus apparently disagreed with a bunch of modern preachers because he was not disagreeing with the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, if a leper was healed or cured of their leprosy in the Old Testament, it was prescribed that they would go to the priest. You understand they didn't have medical doctors back then. They would go to the priest. The priest would inspect them. And if they had indeed be healed, then the priest would declare that they had been healed. They were allowed back into the community because you understand lepers were segregated, quarantined outside the camp. They were allowed back into the community and then they were to offer a sacrifice to God as a thank offering for their healing. So really he disagrees with modern preachers in two different points right here. 
he's not disagreeing with the Old Testament and he's teaching offerings. Picking up in verse 5, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. What is a centurion? Well, you understand it's hard to relate to, but Israel was under an occupational force. They had been conquered. I mean, it would be like we live our lives here, but everywhere you turn around, you know, there's Chinese troops everywhere. And uh, I've thought in times gone by that, you know, it might be a good idea to learn Mandarin, but I don't think we're going to have enough time for that. So I'm not concerned about that anyway. Amen. But uh, amen. There's so many of them that there's, there would be no stopping whatever the Chinese want to do. But anyway, uh, just a picture. If there was an occupational army, they would, be, would they be liked? They would be hated. And so the Romans were an occupational army. Rome had conquered the entire perimeter of the Mediterranean, and then they worked their way up into Europe, all the way up into England, and they were an occupational army in Jesus' day. And a centurion was a Roman soldier, but not just a Roman soldier. Cent, C-E-N-T, is, uh, it means a hundred. So a centurion was someone who ruled a hundred. In other words, he was a, I guess you would say, a, maybe a lieutenant or a major, something of that nature. And so it says here that this centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Now, this is fascinating because he's a, he's a Roman soldier. He is a person of rank, and he comes to Jesus for help, but he comes to Jesus for help not for himself but for his servant. So he's an unusual guy because he's concerned about his servant. I mean, you would think that a soldier in this occupational army would not be concerned about a servant, if the servant dies, so what? You're an occupational army. You just snatch somebody else up off the street and make them your servant. So he was an unusual type person. He was actually a human being, even though he was in this army. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. Say it out loud. Again, we see, Again, we see. Jesus, is willing. Jesus is willing. See, now, a lot of preachers would say, well, you have to get the mind of God. You've got to know what the will of God is. Oh, really? Well, how come Jesus never one time in four Gospels said, well, let me pray about that and see if it's the Father's will that you be healed. How come never one time in four Gospels did he say that? Sometimes it's God's will to heal and sometimes it's not. And let me tell you how Sue and I have come to deal with this over the years. And that is this. Did you notice in the worship time I was encouraging you to live the way you ought to live the six days previous to Sunday? And then on Sunday, come in with a right heart, a right attitude, and enter into the worship, not stand there like a spectator, enter into the worship. Why? Because we don't want to hinder God from doing what God wants to do. See, the will of God is that there not be any sick among us. Look, that was the will of God for the congregation of the Lord coming out of Egypt. They spent 40 years wandering around that desert. Not only, not only does the Bible never record one, one of them dying until he had to get rid of the old, the old unbelieving generation, right? But until that point, there was nobody died of old age or sickness or disease. Their shoes didn't even wear out. And in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were called the servants of God. The servants of God. But you get over into the New Testament, you and I are not called the servants of God. Glory to God. We're called the sons of God. And you understand sons of God means sons and daughters of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's automatically God's will to heal. So our perspective over all these years is if there's not a healing, we got in the way. That's it. In other words, all these preachers, a lot of times what they're trying to do is, is lay the blame at the feet of God. Well, it must not have been the will of God. See, who does that make look bad? That makes God look bad. And so Sue and I have never done that. We have always said, well, if there is a failure, it's on our part, not God's part. If there is a shortfall, it's on our part, not God's part. Let there never be 
a besmirching of the reputation of God come out of our mouths. Let there never be a word come out of our mouths that make people think less of God. Because there's no hope if people come to that opinion. And so I want you to notice he didn't have to pray about it. He didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to go and ask the Father God what his will was. He said immediately, he said, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Just say the word. Just say the word. Now, our problem is that uh, we're so carnal, we don't know God's voice when we hear it. And we're so disrespectful, we can't receive it when we hear it. February of 1997, the Lord spoke to me to put the roof on that church in Mombasa, Kenya. $500,000 turned into $600,000. If we bring that over into 2015 dollars, that was about 2.3 million dollars. And uh, a few years went by. It took all the way from 1997 to January of 2000 to raise that money and to, to get it over there. So think about it. February of 1997 to uh, January of 2000, and still time went by. Still time went by. 2000. Bud Sickler went to be with the Lord January of 2000. All of 2000 went by. All of 2001 went by. All of 2003 went by. Think about it. Time. Tick tock. And I I have to look it up and put this together and find out the exact month. But if I remember right, Sue and I were at a Kenneth Hagin meeting. If I remember right, it was Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, it was a morning session. And he had ministered the word, typical, you know, on the mornings. He ministered on prayer, taught on prayer, nothing unusual. And he gets to the end, and you could always tell when he got to the end and he wasn't done. He was done, but he wasn't done. You could always see it. And that's where he was. And he's up on the podium. I, I've never seen anything like it before or since. He starts down the steps, and he was a heavy man. He was an old man. He liked ice cream. He ate a pint of ice cream every night before he went to bed. And... Uh, Somebody might say, well, he shouldn't have done that. Well, he lived up into his 80s, and he liked it. You know, God bless him. Amen. And uh, he started down those steps, and he was a large man, and he began to fall. But it, it wasn't the weight. It was the anointing. And he fell. But there were no ushers there because they weren't thinking that that would be a possibility. And I've never seen anything like it before or since because something caught him. I mean, the man fell large man and something caught him and gently laid him down on those stairs and he got up he was just laughing laughing you know and like Santa Claus just (laughs) laughing he's just laughing and he came over Sue and I were sitting I think in the second row he came over and he stood in front of us and he began to prophesy over us and he said you thought you heard a miss because see time's gone by I gave that we gave that 500000 turned into 600000 to put that roof on that church. And we gave it as a seed faith because we were stuck up on three and a quarter acres in that little tiny building. We gave it as a seed faith offering. But time's going by. See, time's going by. And, and so maybe, I don't remember being discouraged, but I'm sure I was mindful of it. But I was in the right place at the right time to listen to the right man, and he had the word. But it's more than that. I've got to accept it. I've got to respect it. And more than that, I've got to believe it, and I've got to take it as though it is the word of the Lord. And he said, you thought you heard a miss. But he said, I'm telling you that you heard a right. He said, it shall shortly come. He said, what you have believed for shall come to pass, and it shall shortly come to pass. And if I remember right, we gathered the money up and bought all this land just... uh, in 2004, if I remember right. Actually, it was September 11, 2001, was the first day we met with the architects. We had the building. We had the building. We didn't have the land. We had the building drawn. See, how many times have we heard the voice of God and we didn't know it when we heard it? 
Or how many times have we heard the voice of God and we didn't receive it because we didn't respect our elders and we didn't respect our betters? I don't know about you, but I'm listening. Amen, I'm listening because I'm convinced that the Lord's got my answer. And I'm convinced that he has not left me in the dark. I am convinced that he is speaking. And I've got to be tuned in to hear what he has to say. And then I've got to have the boldness to accept that. See, he said, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word. Just say the word. Just say the word and my servant will be healed for I myself am a man under authority. Now this is not a child of Abraham. This is not a, 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 a member of the tribe of, of Israel. This is, a, this is a Roman centurion. He's not even in the right DNA pool. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. Now, let me say something about authority. He's not describing being, being a man under authority. He's describing being a man of authority. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell that one, come, and he comes. He's not describing being a man under authority. He's describing being a man of authority, but the, the hills are filled with people and preachers who are trying to be a man of authority, but they have never learned how to be a man under authority. And you cannot be a man under you cannot be a man of authority until you have learned how to be a man under authority. I tell this one go and he goes, and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. You know, Leonard Ravenhill, the British revivalist, used to say that. One of these days, some simple soul is going to come along and believe the Bible just as it is written and put us all to shame. Wow. Just believe the Bible. I tell you the truth, I have not heard anyone, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Really, that's a veiled reference to the age of grace that you and I are living in. Most of us here this evening, this morning, are not descendants of Abraham, but we have been grafted in to the tree, the vine of life by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our faith in the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's by grace that you are saved through faith, not by works, so that you cannot boast. We are God's workmanship. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. Say it out loud. Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. So we need to eradicate all speech contrary to those simple words of Jesus from our vocabulary. And uh, I didn't bring a list this morning. I, used, I got a list once from John Osteen, you know, all these trite sayings about how it's just going to get worse and worse. I'd have to look up to see bottom. You know, there's, there's like a whole list of these. And uh, we just need to eradicate everything contrary to the Word of God from our speech patterns. Because he did not say, and, and really, if you'd actually go home this week and meditate on these words, these are alarming words. These are some of the most alarming words you're ever going to read in the Bible. He doesn't say it's going to be done according to the Bible. He doesn't say it's going to be done according to the will of God. He doesn't say it's going to be done unto you according to the will of God. He says it is going to be done just as you believed it would. So what are you believing and what are you saying and what are you acting upon? Are you taking action in fear? 
Are you confessing words of fear? Are you saying what the doctor said? What are you saying? What are you believing? And so the ministry of Jesus is a ministry that brings joy. It brings deliverance. It brings healing. I want to give you some verses as we wrap up this morning because we're short on time. Matthew 8.8. 8. Matthew 8.8. 8. Lord, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Psalm 107, verse 20. Psalm 107, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And the NIV says, he sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. You might be here this morning and, and you're facing something serious. The Bible says he sent forth his word. And that's why we need to be in the place where we hear the word of God on a regular basis. That's why we need to be in a house where the people in the pulpit are speaking life unto our life and they're not speaking death unto our life. I don't want to be anywhere where somebody's confessing I'm going under or I, I could, I, I, it could be the will of God that I be sick or messed up or whatever. No, no. I've got to be in a place where the word is spoken into my life. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from their destructions. He rescue, rescued them from the grave. Job 22, 28, Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. So rather than rehearsing to everybody on the phone what the doctor has said, we ought to be rehearsing, we ought to be declaring what God has said. Jesus took up our infirmities, Jesus bore our diseases, and with his stripes I have been healed. How am I going to be healed? Well, he's going to send his word, and he's going to heal me and deliver me from my destructions. But what word is he going to send that's going to be different from the word he has already sent? And when I receive a word from the Lord, it could be in a sermon, it, it could be uh, in prayer, it could be driving to work, praying as I drive to work. If I hear something that is contrary to the word of God, that word has got to be rejected. But if I hear something in agreement with the word of God, then I'm free to accept it. But I need to declare a thing. What are you declaring? Isaiah 43, 26, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. How was Abraham justified? Abraham was justified when he believed God. We find out over there in Romans 4, in the same way that Abraham was justified by believing God, we too are justified by believing God. To take him at his word. Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Just to take God at his word. This is what he said. Jesus took up my infirmities and he bore my diseases. If Jesus took up my infirmities and bore my diseases, that means he has them and I don't. And so that's my confession. You know, things have changed a little bit now that I'm, I'm uh, 59 years old. I, I feel parts of my body I didn't used to feel. So, you know, like my, my knees. And, uh, and so I'll be walking and praying, and I'll just confess what the Word of God says. Jesus took up my infirmities and bore my diseases, you know. But if you start acting like some old person and talking like some old person and moaning and groaning like some old person, you'll turn into an old person. Hey Amen. I'm still doing my four miles. Satan's just got to get behind me. Amen. He's not going to stop me. He's not going to slow me down. I'm not going to stop or slow down. No, 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 no. Jesus took up my infirmities and bore my diseases, and with his stripes I have been healed. Why don't you lift your hands and say, open your mouth and say it out loud. Jesus, Jesus. took up my infirmities and bore my diseases with his stripes. I have been healed. Say it again. Jesus, Jesus took up my infirmities and bore my diseases with his stripes. I have been healed. See, when you open your mouth and you let the word of God come out of your mouth, you know what? God is sending his word and healing you and delivering you of your destructions. Well, I thought somebody else had to say it. Show me where that's written. I said, show me where that's written. 
See, if the centurion had been a believer, watch it now, if the centurion had been a believer, he wouldn't have even needed to look Jesus up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If the centurion had been a believer, he wouldn't have even needed to leave the house. Hallelujah. He sent his word and delivered them from their destructions. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from the grave. But it doesn't say who has to send the word. I can send the word. I don't know why I can't do that. I send emails to myself all the time. I'll be out somewhere and I'll think of something that I got to bring up in staff meeting. I'll send an email to myself. Well, that's what I'm doing. I'm sending the word to myself. It's like one of those Australian boomerangs. And, and I'm saying, I'm declaring, declare a thing. Decree a thing and it shall be done unto thee. Decree a thing, declare a thing. Stop talking about what you're afraid of. Stop talking about what the devil has said, stop talking about what disease some relative died of. No, no, no. Stay, st open your mouth and declare what God has said about your life. Decree a thing and it shall be done unto thee. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them of their destructions. Huh? I don't see any prohibition against me doing the Sunday. Well, where's that in the New Testament? Well, I'm glad you asked. 1 Peter 2.9, 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so I see that I shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto me. I see that I am to declare unto God his word. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. And I am to declare the praises of him who called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. To see his word come to pass in your life, you must believe in your heart. You must confess with your mouth, and you've got to walk by faith. What does that mean? I've got to walk by the word and not by my senses. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Just say the word, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, he did. How many words do you need? Just say the, just say the word, Lord. Well, he already did. Hallelujah. So I've got to get in here and I've got to find those scriptures that cover my situation. And then you know what I've got to do? I've got to be the one doing the declaring. Yeah. Well, Pastor, I thought somebody, I thought Pastor Sue would do it for me. Well, wait a minute. She's got stuff she's believing God for herself. How about you? How about you? Why don't you just cover your situation with the word of God? Yeah. Hallelujah. Father, we just give you praise this morning because I believe the work that you have begun in us, you are continuing. I thank you, Holy Spirit of God, for confirming your word this morning with signs and wonders following. I thank you for the, uh, the bound being set free. I thank you for the sick being healed. I thank you, Father God, for that which man said would not come to pass. It's unable to come to pass. It can't come to pass. There's no way it's going to happen. I thank you, Father God, that you are setting before this congregation an open door which no man can shut. I thank you, Father God, that lawsuits are settled, deals are closed, sales are closed, uh, sales are funded. I thank you, Father God, we just rebuke and renounce every evil spirit standing in the way of every believer here this morning because the Bible says that you delivered them from their destructions. And that's what we say, Lord God, that everybody under the sound of my voice is delivered from their destructions. We declare it in the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, and we give you the praise for it. And everybody said amen. amen. Say it out loud. I'm the blessed and healed of God from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. Hallelujah. Well, I'm out of time. I hope you enjoyed the message this morning.